if you have water to throw away, throw it on a plant Mm -hmm. rather than just sending it down, you know, the drain. And if we all did that, we could have a little bit of, you know, some kind of salad greens on the porch that we could pick. And there's another advantage. Most of the food that we eat, even though we might be buying it at the natural food store and it's organic, how long ago was it in the ground? maybe two weeks, maybe six weeks, maybe two months. So when we start eating things that are so fresh that they're like we're growing five minutes ago, 10 minutes ago, the amount of life force that you get from eating things like this was just growing, you can't buy that at the store. Namaste. You're listening to the Savannah Podcast. Join us on an exploration of Eastern spirituality, yoga philosophy, and conscious living for the new age. This podcast is a production of SavannahSpirit.com, the best place to shop for unique clothing, spiritual handcrafted jewelry, healing gemstones, and fair trade gifts from the Far East. Now, here's your host, Brett Larkin. Welcome, my friends, to the Savannah Podcast. Today, we are speaking to herbalist Bridget Mars about hacks to create an edible lawn that also heals us. You do not need to become a botanist or spend hundreds of dollars a month buying expensive herbs to integrate natural remedies into your life. You just don't. There are so many plants and natural, healthy, accessible things literally in our own backyards. And Bridget's will be walking us through today some of these simple techniques that we can use to improve our health, improve our mental and emotional balance, and also take better care of the planet. Before we dive in, I just wanted to thank so many of you who recently left ratings and reviews of the show. This helps get the podcast in front of even more people looking to improve their life through yoga, meditation, and natural healing. So I'd like to ask you today to please consider leaving us a rating or short review on iTunes, even if that's not how you normally listen to the show. All right, now to formally introduce our guests for today, Bridget Mars, herbalist and nutritional consultant with close to 50 years experience. Get ready, guys. She teaches herbal medicine at Naropa University, the Omega Institute, Esalen Kripalu, Sivananda Yoga Ashram, the Mayo Clinic, and so many more. She blogs for the Huffington Post and has authored numerous books and DVDs, including the home reference to holistic health and healing, the desktop guide to herbal medicine, so many more. And she's going to be speaking at the Arise Festival, August 4th through 6th in Fort Collins, Colorado, for those of you that are heading that way. Bridget, thanks so much for being with us today. Thank you so much. Blessings. And um, it's actually Brigitte. I'm French Canadian. Oh my goodness. I wish I had known before we started. I love it. Brigitte. I think it's beautiful. So maybe that's a great place to start because I didn't realize you were French Canadian. You live in Colorado now, but tell tell us just a little bit about yourself and how you got interested and set on this path before we dive into all the juicy stuff. Okay, well, I had this wonderful French Canadian grandmother and she was like many women of her time, you know, very adept at knowing about how do you treat all your sick children when the only doctor in town is gone fishing or hunting or something. So my grandmother's idea of ice cream was to put maple syrup on snow. She made soap in a cauldron and she knew all the plants and plants that could heal people and animals. And when I was maybe three or four, I said, I want to know how to do that. And so by the time I was a teenager, um, I went to an all girls school and I was sort of the alternative nurse. Um, there was a nurse, but if you came to my room, I was going to give you chamomile tea or rescue remedy or peppermint tea. And by the time I was 15, I I knew that that's what I wanted to do with my life. And by the time I was 17, I was managing a natural food store in the Virgin Islands. And that's, it's such a wonderful path because you really feel you get to help people and the planet at the same time. So from a very young age, because of your grandmother and your family, this was just something you were naturally pulled towards. Did you, when you were young, have any immediate experience with this where you fell quite ill or you saw someone else fall ill and these medicines really worked their magic or it was just part of your lifestyle from day one? Well, I certainly was raised in an era where you had to have shots Um, And I never liked that. And antibiotics, I was on antibiotics all the time. I had acne as a teenager. And, you know, the remedy was more antibiotics or, you know, pills and 
creams and things like that. And I was determined, like, I'm going to find a way to get healthier. I don't want to go to the ear, nose and throat doctor. And yet they would tell you things that I think probably contributed to making me sick, like drink a glass of milk with every meal. And I probably had a dairy allergy. And that's why I always had an ear infection or a sore throat. Um, and so I learned that I need to take matters into my own hands and I'm really here to help people take responsibility for their own health. I don't claim to cure people, but I teach people how they can heal themselves. But I did have an early experience where my little sister developed a terrible skin rash. And my parents took her to many specialists and she was prescribed number of drugs. And I remember saying it started when she started using that popular bubble bath that they were advertising on TV. And, you know, hundreds of dollars later and many specialists and drugs later, it was the bubble bath. So even at age like 12 or 13, like, uh, we should look at stuff like that. So what we put on our bodies is going to be to some degree absorbed into our bodies. And we should also think about how we vote with our dollars. Do we want to be purchasing products that are made with artificial dyes that are damaging to the environment? Or do we want to be supporting fields of lavender and rosemary and things that are a habitat for the bees? So everything is connected. And so um, whether it's what we eat or what we put on our bodies, it still can make a difference. I think you're tapping into something that's really, I feel, resonating right now globally, which is that people want to take health back into their own hands and people are really realizing that the skin is the largest organ in the body and what we put on our face and on our hair affects us, affects our children. And we want to start making steps to really simplifying and maybe creating even our own medicine, ingredients, body washes, things like that in order to really know what we're putting into our system. But I think so many people, myself included, often get intimidated because this world of like natural healing and herbalism seems there's so much like even just looking at all the books you've written and how huge your expertise is it's just like oh my gosh there's so many plants and so many different ways you could use them from infusions to tinctures to everything and what I love about what you're going to share with us in this conversation is just to really take it a step back and say what are some simple things the average yogi or average person can do just in their backyard just simple things to start integrating plants and healing into our daily life, into our kitchen. Why don't you start telling us what your ideas are for us here? I would be more than happy to. Well, one thing is you don't have to learn all the plants on the planet, but if you could start by learning what's growing around you, and it's said that the average American recognizes over a thousand logos and the products they're associated with, and yet maybe less than five birds or five plants in their area. So, you know, why don't you start learning about what grows around you? And unfortunately, we've been bamboozled by the media to think that what grows around us that's wild <laughs> needs to be eradicated. And I really feel like I'm a champion for the dandelion because the dandelion is one of the top five most nutritious vegetables. And um, rather than seeing it as a weed, well, what's really amazing about the dandelion, it's very dry right now. It hasn't rained in a good rain in a, a few weeks and the grass is dying. However, the dandelions survive. They thrive. They are hardy and adaptable. They survive without uh, very much water. They are, no one plants them. They don't have mulch or fertilizer. And so we can learn some skills from these wild plants because Grass is one of the most water-intensive crops on the face of the earth. It's said that we're using about a third of our nation's water supply to water grass. And that's crazy. Mm -hmm. It's a crop that we don't even eat, uh, um, you know, unless you're a goat or a cow or something. And yes, you can drink wheatgrass juice, but I don't think that's why most people have these lawns. And then we spend all this energy watering and growing this and then we mow it down and put these grass clippings in plastic bags, which also creates garbage and waste because the grass clippings could be fertilizer for the earth or mulch or um, help keep the earth cool or return nutrients to the earth. So that whole concept of the American lawn is was something started by the European aristocracy. And that might have been cool in the 1800s, but we really need to rethink how we use water. And I'm a big advocate of not wasting it and 
flooring it on lawns. So if you are going to have a lawn, you know, why not think about things that are edible and medicinal and that provide habitats for the bees? Because we all know the bees are dying at an alarming rate. And so we can't solve all the problems on the planet by ourselves, but most people have a little patch of something, whether it be a porch or a balcony or a small front lawn. If we just start thinking about what we have that we can have some control over and start returning it to more greenery. So let's say you're thinking about planting a lawn. Why not plant something that grows very small and short, but still produces flowers so that it could be a uh, you know, pollen for the bees. Dandelion, by the way, is one of the first foods for the bees in the springtime. There's so much here I love that you're saying that I want to dive into because I already have so many questions. And where I live in California, you know, we've been experiencing a lot of drought in the past couple of years and more and more people are kind of transforming their lawns into sort of rock gardens or into, you know, sort of those most, you, you know what I'm talking about. What are your feelings on that? Because that seems like, oh, it's good because there's no longer water needed to, to mow the lawn or keep the grass green. But at the same time, it seems like we're maybe losing the ability to connect with with plants as well. So what's sort of like the ideal lawn patch situation for someone who is conscious of all these issues and then is excited to try to integrate and maybe create some of their own herbs and medicine as well? Well, those rock gardens, unfortunately, um, since they are devoid of plants, we need to remember that the plants are providing oxygen for the planet. They help to break down the carbon dioxide and carbon um, and the carbon monoxide. So they're actually helping to make the air quality healthier. So I know the rock garden maybe seems like a simple thing, but learning to find plants that will survive in the drought. And very often, if we take a look at what is growing wild in the area, because the wild plants have adapted to conditions like drought. So, you know, in California, you know, look at, see what is growing wild anyways. What are the surviving plants and grow more of those. And I think the worst thing is when you have a rock garden and then a weed comes up and then people ah, spray that <laughs> as if it were an enemy. And I'd say, um, you know, find what will thrive in your area, rosemary, thyme, lavender. I'm in Colorado, so we have different plants there, but I do go to California and I see the drought is really, really a serious thing. And we need to change the way we treat water. So another thing I'm suggesting that people do is having a basin in their sink. And there's so much water that gets just sent down the drain every day. The water from rinsing a dish before you put it in the dishwasher or rinsing an apple. What if everybody collected that water and several times during the day you opened the front door or the porch door and you gave that water to the mint plants or a raspberry bush? So I'm really trying to encourage people to be about recreating Eden. And a quote that I heard when I was maybe 14, 15 years old was, if you have water to throw away, throw it on a plant rather than just sending it down, you know, the drain. And if we all did that, we could have a little bit of, you know, some kind of salad greens on the porch that we could pick. And there's another advantage. Most of the food that we eat, even though we might be buying it at the natural food store and it's organic, how long ago was it in the ground? Maybe two weeks, maybe six weeks, maybe two months. So when we start eating things <clears throat> that are so fresh that they're like we're growing five minutes ago, 10 minutes ago, the amount of life force that you get from eating things like this was just growing, you can't buy that at the store. And I am so about trying to help people regain their health. And I do think that there's a lot of power in eating these survivor plants. So things that maybe we were conditioned often by the pesticide companies to think are enemies are really our allies and every wild weed really all of the vegetables that we eat they started out with an ancestor that was a wild plant so lamb's quarter rather than thinking it's an enemy it's wild spinach why would you spray that or destroy that and then go buy inorganic spinach from another state that is in a plastic bag with a barcode. When nature is offering you, I know in California, you're blessed with a lot of miner's lettuce. And purslane, another so-called weed, was Gandhi's favorite food. And it's really high in omega-3s, so makes great salsa. And gazpacho. This podcast was brought to you by savannaspirit.com. In ancient Indian mythology, and even today, Chakras are considered to be the most important energy centers in the body. 
It's been said that when all seven energy points are aligned, deep spiritual development occurs. When the chakras come into balance, they bring harmony, spiritually, mentally, and emotionally. In fact, sometimes when we feel off, it's really just these energy points that need to be worked on. Celebrate the seven chakras with a beautiful must-have chakra tank. Printed down the spine with sophisticated metallic ink, the chakras are represented by unique hand-drawn symbols. You can add a pop to your style with elegance, all while reminding yourself of the deeper spiritual truth of our world. Use the exclusive discount code PODCAST30 for 30% off your first order today. Do you want a $25 gift card from savannaspirit.com completely for free? It's super easy. All you have to do is fill out a quick survey with seven short questions, and then you'll be emailed your gift card to use whenever you're ready. This survey will help us better understand the most important thing in the world, you. Go to savannaspirit.com forward slash podcast survey today and claim your reward. Again, that's savannaspirit.com forward slash podcast survey. I love, I think the big piece of advice you're giving us here, which I so appreciate is that really we need to think local first because I think so many people do get overwhelmed and they want to get involved with, as I said, whether it's making their own body lotions or bringing natural healing remedies into their house, they think they need this like Encyclopedia Britannica book and amount of knowledge. And really it just involves figuring out what's naturally growing nearby us and then sort of riffing off that as we create our own little personal Eden which I love what you said. And I love this idea of saving the water because I think that just makes so much logical sense. I can't believe no one's thought of that or has told me that before because it's, of course, it's completely logical. So you've talked about dandelions and a couple other things. Tell us how, and I know people, it'll vary depending on where they live and what region they're in. But instead of treating my dandelions as weeds, what, what is it that you're suggesting me to do with them? Am I supposed to pick them, eat them, infuse them? Give us, a, give us some insight there. Okay. Well, I, I just want to back up a little bit and say, you know, get a book on plants of your area, go on an herb walk, go find some old timer or farmer that, you know, a curandera, someone who knows the plants and go with them. I'm giving two herb walks this weekend, but find out who's doing this in your area. So um, what I do when I go out to the garden is I bring a colander with me and let's say I'm really trying to grow tomatoes, but there's a lot of weeds all around the tomatoes. Well, I want to allow the tomatoes to have a lot of space. So I'm going to pull those weeds and put them in the colander and turn them into the evening salad or soup. Um, dandelions, especially in the springtime before they flower, are make a wonderful salad. You can eat the flowers. They're really high in lutein, which is good for your eyes. You could blend them into a smoothie. You could put them into honey. I actually make a really great dandelion loaf, <laughs> gluten-free. Um, you can also... Uh, make medicine out of them. Maybe you want to dry some of those herbs and keep them for tea for the winter. And um, yesterday I was with someone who had eczema. Dandelion root is a wonderful herb for eczema. So this person could maybe learn how to tincture it or they could uh, dry the root and then make a tea out of it for the winter. So it's, you know, it's a subject, but just like people learned how to, you know, cook, you know, cook a pot of rice, uh, scramble an egg. You can learn how to make herbal medicine medicines and it's really simple kitchen medicine. We need to keep in mind that this is medicine for the people. It's what people have been doing, millions of people for thousands of years. And how often, if you ever watch TV, do you see a recall on a drug that was approved only to be recalled because it has so many side effects? And so I feel connected to the earth and connected to nature when I say I'm going to use something that's been really time tested millions of people thousands of years and you can't say that about any of the drugs so in your own lawn or when you're guiding others do you suggest really it sounds like to me what I'm hearing is like there is no weed killers or chemicals or anything that you're using at all is that right 
Um, no, not at all. And I have made sprays. We had a problem with aphids years ago, and I made a spray with garlic, onions, and cayenne pepper. I've also used uh, Dr. Bronner's peppermint soap as a spray. But these are some non-toxic alternatives and it's really simple. I mean, one of my great teachers was a, a woman, like a hill woman, some might call her a hillbilly, who, you know, was an old person who didn't have a lot of education, but had knowledge of the plant. So if these, you know, people who really do live back to the land can have figured this out, or people that maybe even a thousand years ago who didn't even know how to read and write, it's, it's not that difficult to attune to this, to learn to identify a few plants in your area. And, you know, very often the remedy we need is growing right near us. So yes, there are some poisonous plants, poison hemlock, poison ivy. Learn to identify the poisonous plants. I should also say uh, one of the contributions I've tried to make to the herbal realm is I have a phone app called iPlant and a couple of um, former Navy SEALs helped me design this and it only works for iPhone or iPad, but it's pictures of like 200 plants. But there's so many ways to learn and we should certainly keep learning our whole life. And what a more wonderful thing than to teach our children the names of the plants. So when my kids were little, they'd say, mom, can I have some money? And I'd say, sure, let's go for a little walk. I'll give you a quarter for every plant you can identify. 50 cents if you know the Latin name, a dollar if you can tell me three uses of the plant. And, you know, in California, where you do have things like earthquakes and uh, which are happening more all around the country, I mean, wouldn't it be great to know what things you could eat until Red Cross got there? I mean, people think, oh my God, I don't have a can opener. And yet there's so much. I actually lived for two and a half years totally off of wild edible plants. Oh my gosh, that's amazing. Amazing. Yeah, no, I asked about the the pesticides because I know that for a lot of people, that there is like this safety concern. It's like, oh, if I'm using chemicals in one part of my garden, you know, I can't, it, it makes it a little scarier if you're just sort of all of a sudden like eating everything. And, and I like what you're saying about how, yes, sometimes you do need to, you know, control certain plants, but you created your own natural ways to do that. I love the Dr. Bronner soap and, and that's, an, that's, just such a great, great tip. So what basic supplies do you think someone going into this needs in terms of, you know, either things to make tinctures, or I know you have so many great recipes on your website as well for different soups. Maybe you can tell us a little bit about those and sort of what, not maybe your garden, because I'm sure it's incredible, but, but someone who's just starting out, like how they could integrate some of the things that are growing into their yard into their day, whether it's like, oh, they make a tea with the dandelion root in the morning. And then at lunch, they have a soup that's, you know, a dinner, a salad that's part, you know, can you kind of walk us through that and what someone would need? Well, a lot of it you probably already have. So, you know, a, a good book or two, um, a colander. You know, I find a blender a very helpful tool. A blender is helpful for pureeing herbs. Maybe you want to make a pesto. The word pesto means paste, and a pesto is a really great way of, you know, preserving an abundance of an herb. And it could be um, greens like lamb's quarter, but it could be arugula. It could be cilantro or basil or thyme or rosemary that you just blend up with olive oil and garlic, for example and make some kind of, um, you know, pesto. And you could freeze it for the winter, put it in little ice cube trays and then thaw out what you need when you need it. You know, apple cider vinegar is a great tool. Most people already have that. Uh, a pot to boil water in. I mean, making tea is so simple. You bring a pot of water to a boil, turn the heat off, and then add about a heaping teaspoon of herb per cup of water. That's a simple way to make a tea. Um, I sometimes use ball jars where I put dried herb in a ball or mason jar, cover it to the top with hot water, put the lid on and let it sit overnight. And then a strainer would be another helpful tool because you don't have to drink the really fibrous plants. But, you know, basically I like to say eat more greens. In the color spectrum, green is right in the middle. And green indicates the presence of chlorophyll. And there's only one atom of difference between chlorophyll and hemoglobin. So chlorophyll builds our blood. It brings oxygen into our bodies. So I like to find ways to include more greens in my diet. So salad, soup is really easy. The soup could be raw or cooked. You know, in the summertime, I'm likely to do a, a lot more raw soups, blend an avocado, tomato, and some 
wild greens with a little salt and a little lemon juice makes a delicious soup. But in the winter, maybe you want to blend it with, you know, potatoes. I like to use blue potatoes, which are closer to the origin. You could also dry the herbs and that's very simple. So then maybe a paper bag is really as high tech as it needs to get. You put your herbs in a paper bag and place it in a warm room in the house with plenty of uh, room for air movement in the paper bag. And then when it's dry, store it in a jar and label it. And you could have tea all winter of lemon balm or peppermint or um, something, you know, really common, even stinging nettles, um, which I know sting and people are really afraid of them. But actually, um, nettles is really high in iron. And when you make tea out of it, it doesn't sting. And the sting is actually really good for arthritic pain. Mm, Okay, so talking about arthritis, I'd love for you to tell us now some of the herbs that you use instead of drugs, right? Because I think a lot of us would love just to know some first aid basics of things that we can use in our kitchen, in our home, instead of, again, constantly reaching for the pharmacy or, you know, even having to go down the route of antibiotics or things like that. So do you have some favorite herbs that are maybe also growable or easily findable depending on where you live for basic things like headaches or little cuts and scrapes or nausea or cramps or things like that? Well, a really simple thing that almost everyone already has in their kitchen, and I've taught about this at many festivals, including Arise, is apple cider vinegar, two teaspoons of apple cider vinegar, and two teaspoons of honey stirred into a glass of warm water. It's good for like a hundred different things. (laughs) Nausea, headache, stomach ache, food poisoning, digestive distress, um, infertility, arthritis. So, boy, that's simple. Try that before you take some kind of pharmaceutical drug. It's almost like people have given the power of their health away to somebody else. And I think that that's something we've been conditioned to do. Like, oh, you couldn't possibly be smart enough to know how to take care of your own body. And yet you live there. So um, we really need to wake up. And rather than only looking for the remedy for the illness, we should also be looking at what is causing the illness. Could it be some of the junk food that's being advertised to us on TV? So, you know, I certainly think, you know, look at what you put in your body, regard your body as a temple and, you know, do healthy practices and, you know, support the companies that are doing good things for the environment, whether it be that they're run on wind power or solar power, or they're using a uh, soy-based stink or, or donating a portion of the proceeds to rainforest action or so that's really important so everything is connected and we make choices all day long so I forget what the question was but well I'm gonna I'm gonna come back to it but it's okay because you you got me I wanted to ask you to go deeper on something too but so we were gonna give us some specific herbs for Rem- certain different remedies, common remedies. But before we do that, I just wanted to ask you once again, because I think I want to make sure listeners really get this, because I think I'm having an aha moment, which is that this importance of understanding what's local. You said something earlier that's like the things that are naturally surrounding us locally are also the things we need the most. Like, for example, I think most people understand and buy into like, oh, local honey could help my allergies, right? Because it's local and it's the same, you know, pollen and allergens and and all that stuff. But I think you're saying something that's sort of like that for everything. Well, for example, for poison ivy, there's almost always a remedy within a hundred feet. I got bit by a copperhead snake years ago and the remedy was right next to where the snake was. The echinacea was an herb that our native peoples use for treating snake bite and that's where it was. So learn to identify what's around you. And I also want to go back to your original question is that very often we have a lot of natural medicines in our kitchen. Honey is good for burns. We have lemon juice, apple cider vinegar, cabbage, salt. And these are things that people all around the world often have. But then, you know, another thing I would almost always have in my first aid kit, a bottle of tea tree oil, which is not local or native, but it is in the same family as eucalyptus. But tea tree oil, a little bottle of that, it's a first aid kit in a bottle. So it's native to Australia. So that's not local. But I love the idea that you don't have to have a huge, you know, plethora of remedies. You can find a few things, peppermint tea, echinacea tincture, tea tree oil, lavender oil, which does grow in throughout the United States. 
Yeah, and that the natural world around us is supporting us and taking care of us because I think a lot of people are scared, right? Like scared to like pull a dandelion out of their backyard and then make something with it. Like that seems somehow frightening, like it's an unknown. But what you're saying is no, like we're all part of this larger ecosystem and the things that are available naturally around us in most cases are supporting us. Or even if they're dangerous, there is something that is equally healing very close by. And when you sort of take the flip side of that, which is like popping an aspirin or popping a Tylenol or some other pharmaceutical that we have no idea what's in it, it, it does sort of seem like we're just sort of giving our giving our power, giving our, our control of what we put in our body away, which is, it's interesting. But we certainly do not want to collect plants within 50 feet of a busy road. And if, <laughs> yes. if your yard has been sprayed within two years, um, you want to collect elsewhere. Bec- and, um, you know, stop spraying and educate your neighbors. I'm actually have been going into places of business where I see pesticides applied signs and saying, I will never do business with your bank because you spray pesticides. And people think, well, it's my yard. I can do what I want. But it ends up going into the air and going into the water when the rains come. And we're all connected. It's not just your little piece of land. And um, I have a daughter who lives in LA and had uh, put a beehive in her backyard and the bees were thriving and a neighbor sprayed um, that terrible glycophosphate pesticide that gets advertised on TV and all her bees were dead the next day. And so it is affecting your neighbors and all of those bees could be pollinating the fruit that you're hoping to buy at the farmer's market, the peaches and the cherries and the plums, because three out of every four bites of food we eat are pollinated by our bee allies. Close your eyes. Imagine yourself transported to an oceanfront tropical paradise where you're sipping on kombucha, watching the sunset as the waves roll in. You're spending your days practicing yoga in the sand and taking your first surf lesson. I'm so excited to announce that this could be your reality. We've partnered with our friends at Yogascapes to give away two tickets to one of their beautiful Costa Rican yoga retreats. Not only that, but we've also partnered with five more of our favorite brands to chip in for a total prize package worth over $5,000. Head over to savannaspirit.com forward slash Costa Rica to learn more. And you mentioned bees before, and I I made a note here to ask you more about it because you seem to imply that one of the biggest and best things we can do in creating our own little personal Eden or backyard slice of the world to improve our health and hopefully that of those around us as well was to try to create an atmosphere that would be bee friendly and be comfortable. (laughs) What other uh, tips or advice do you have about about that? I mean, I don't know if everyone wants to become a full on beekeeper, but what, what are little things we can do to encourage and support our bees? Well, look for plants that make really easy food for the bees. I think of thyme. I think of lemon balm is a really easy one. So if you're a beginning gardener and you want to really build your confidence, lemon balm comes up year after year. You can make tea out of it. It's in the mint family. It's totally safe and friendly. I like to crush up lemon balm and put it in my bottle of water. It makes the water taste lemony. It's an antidepressant. It's a natural remedy for attention deficit. And you could even make pesto out of it or put it in your salad or your your green smoothies or green juice. Um, So that's a really easy one. And there's always this concern, like, I'm afraid it's going to take over. Well, if you have a whole lot of it, then dry it for tea for the winter, or you can dry it and use it even in the bathtub as a relaxing antidepressant bath. You could make holiday gifts, but the fact that it's growing, you're actually being part of the solution rather than part of the problem. Is there another one like that, like lemon balm for the beginner gardener that you'd recommend? 
I, you know, violets are really easy to grow. They're one of the first things that come up in the spring. You can eat the violet leaves. They are a traditional anti-cancer herb. You can eat the violet flowers. Um, but thyme would make a really nice lawn. It's very low growing. It's wonderful for the bees. Um, I think Shakespeare alluded to the fact that the fact <laughs> that fairies love to dance upon a bed of thyme. So that's a really nice herb and low growing and you can use it for food and medicine. It's particularly antimicrobial and great for lung health. And I like that you mentioned that because that's something we could do as an alternative to grass, basically. Or if we, you know, maybe have a grass lawn and we're looking to either reduce the amount of grass or potentially eliminate it, that's something we could think about. Are there any others you suggest? Well, white clover would be another thing you could do. So if you want a short lawn because you have kids that are playing frisbee or pets that like to frolic, um, white clover, can um, you can find a variety that's very short growing and the flowers are tiny. So the bees will have a, an opportunity to, you know, do their magic and help pollinate. And um, it still works. It's not, you know, so long that you're in a jungle. <laughs> yes, we don't want to be in a jungle. I like how you added, so of course, the our environment is naturally supporting us, but we do live in modern times, right? So we don't want to be collecting herbs or flowers by the side of the freeway, and we want to be conscious of what our neighbors are doing to, to keep ourselves safe. What advice do you have for our listeners who are maybe living in cities or maybe living in more urban environments and what they can do? I'm assuming, you know, I definitely see those little planter boxes of herbs or just something that they could put on a windowsill or porch. What, what advice do you have for those folks? Okay, well, I do live in the city and I do compost. So we have a big compost bin. Um, it's really not that hard. And I actually grow a lot of plants on the sidewalk. So all of that little area, which I don't legally own, um, but I'm going to garden anyways. And I have to admit, I'm a bit of a, a pirate. I go around early in the morning with a shovel and I plant trees, not only on where I the block I live, but other blocks too. I stick little trees here and there in parks, put some bricks around it, and you can't be attached. They're not all going to be there. But another proverb that I heard years ago is the best time to plant a tree is 20 years ago. The next best time is now. And I love that I can walk through the neighborhood and there's plums and apples and peaches and mulberries. And another really easy thing to grow is service berry also known as Juneberry. It's a, a small shrub, or there's several varieties of it, but it can be a small shrub that produces abundance of blueberries that are delicious and you don't have seeds and you can collect a lot of them from one plant. So knowing about a few plants that produce a lot that don't take up too much room. So also think about also in the city, you could learn to do some kitchen gardening like sprouting. So that's something that I do a lot of in the winter, just growing things on your, you know, near your windowsill. But also what, what do you have? Maybe you have a porch, maybe you have a balcony, maybe you can grow some culinary herbs, maybe you can get some nice pots and plant on um, lettuce so you have that growing fresh. And certainly, um, I love the addition of culinary herbs, basil and cilantro. Um, we can never have too much of those. And it seems like so many of these things we can just drink as infusions and that they can just be so, so simple. Do you want to tell our listeners just what an infusion, just, just in case they don't know, like what an infusion is and how simple it can be to just have either like a cold um, lilac water infusion. I think you have a recipe for that somewhere or maybe something that's more hot and medicinal. Do you want to give us some examples just to get us inspired? Well, there's, you know, there's a lot of... Um teas, the word teas and infusion are often used interchangeably. And I don't want to make it confusing, but you know, a tea, I did describe like just bringing water to a boil and adding a heaping teaspoon of dried herb or two or three heaping teaspoons of fresh herb and then covering it and letting it sit for maybe 10 minutes. So that's a tea. But to make an infusion, you're going to use a lot more herb. And I love the idea of working with thyme, T-I-M-E. So I um, put maybe a an inch of dried herb in a glass jar and cover it to the top with hot water, put the lid on, and then in the morning strain it. So that's considered an overnight infusion. And that's going to extract the most amount of nutrients from your plants. So I love to do that with things like nettles and dandelion. Um, but there's a lot of varieties and ways that you can do it when you're making a tea from roots. Generally, people simmer them at a low boil for about 20 minutes. Um, 
So one of the books I've written, The Desktop Guide to Herbal Medicine, has directions on you know how to make a tea, a tincture, a salve, a poultice, a compress. But again, it's none of this is difficult. This is kitchen medicine that people have done in very primitive situations where they don't have electricity, and you can do it too because we probably have electricity. Yes, we have so much more. There's really no excuse. I think I, listening to you, it's just really taking the time to educate yourself. And I want to ask you two more things before we, we close our time together. I really was excited and inspired by what you said about how we want to eat more green, right? And, and that the, the fresher, or if we grow it at home, there's going to be more life force, or I'd even like say prana, right? More prana in the salad that's from our backyard, as opposed to even one we get from the farmer's market. And people who are listening at home couldn't see you, but I know when you talked about green, you took your hand to your heart. And I know, of course, as a yogi, that green is also the color of our heart chakra, heart center. And I've always heard, you know, eat more greens, greens are good for you, liquid chlorophyll is great for you. But I'd never really, heard someone talk about taking that into the chakra system and the heart center and and prana. Can you just riff on that a little bit more for me? Because I I think that's really cool. Well, I actually want to encourage people to eat the rainbow. (laughs) And I do work with the chakra system a lot and talk about that. So every different color of a plant indicates a different phytonutrient, like lycopene is found in red plants, um, like cherries or tomatoes or watermelon or guava, red onion, and then maybe um, orange plants are high in beta carotene and yellow might indicate the presence of vitamin C and then um, green, you know, right in the center, then blue, indigo and violet plants are often good for our higher centers. So things like plums and elderberries and blue potatoes and blueberries and blackberries, elderberries are going to give us something called anthocyanins and they're going to be really good for brain function and also nourishing the nervous system so one of the ways i check in with my grandchildren is like what colors did you eat today and so eat the rainbow but remember green is in the center and how can you add more greens to your food they're usually not the most flavorful like you know peaches or cherries but they give us minerals that we really need and they also help to prevent infection so yes eat Eat the rainbow, but remember, greens are in the center. Most of the red, orange, yellow are considered warming, and then blue, indigo, and violet are considered cooling, whereas green is, as Goldilocks said, just right. Just right, just in the center. And green, that heart chakra, is the fulcrum, the balance point between the lower and upper chakras, which which I also think is really nice. I have to ask you, because we're on this topic, what your thoughts are on Ayurveda? I have studied Ayurvedic medicine and I appreciate that there's, uh, this is a wonderful tradition. I've studied Chinese medicine, but again, I'm going, even though I love the principles of looking at people having different doshas and constitutions, um, I think that you can still apply that to using local plants. So rather than saying, oh, I need to find, uh, you know, Brahmi or Shatavari well, okay, that's great. If I were in India, maybe I would use those. But what do I have here that would um, also be balancing to the doshas? But I, you know, I love all of it. I respect the wonderful traditions of herbal medicine where they wrote it down and we can learn from that today. Wonderful. All right. So my last question for you, and this has been so incredibly fun, is I just wanted to touch, <laughs> I know it's a, it's a big topic and we've had other entire podcasts just on this topic, but since you're such an expert in this, I wanted to just touch on this idea of using plants that are potentially psychoactive in uh, sacred use or as part of a meditation or spiritual practice. Is there anything you want to share about or, you know, kind of top three things you want people to know about that if they're looking into that or interested in that? Sure. I love that topic. And that's actually a topic that I speak on a lot. I will be speaking at a RISE Festival on August 4th through the 6th. And one of the many workshops I'll be doing there is called Sacred Psychoactives. And I feel that in the whole festival scene, there's so many festivals going on. And I love 
arise that happens in Colorado, Fort Collins, which is a most beautiful place at the Sunrise Ranch, which has long been a spiritual community. And a lot of young people take um, plants that we might consider psychedelic, psychoactive, shamanistic, hallucinogenic. And so they've asked me to come in and teach a workshop on the safe and sacred use of these plants. Because personally, I think that these are plants that should be used with intention and in a safe set and setting. And so I have come up with an acronym. Actually, my partner came up with the acronym EPIC. Epic. How do you have an epic experience? And so epic stands for educate. So let's say you were thinking about taking something. Well, maybe you should talk to others who've taken it. Maybe you want to read about it. What are the effects of it? What does it do to your body? Um, how does long does it last, for example? What is a safe dosage? There's a great website called Arrowid, E-R-O-W-I-D, that has a lot of information. And then I stands for intention. Why are you doing this? Well, it's good to think about that ahead of time. Are you doing it just because someone gave it to you? Just because something's available doesn't mean it's the right time to do it. And I do think sometimes a festival situation might be overwhelming where there's thousands of people and you lose your friends and it's very hot and where's the water and um, it's loud. Some of the music is great. Some of it might sound like monsters chasing you. So um, intention, like, you know, I want to uh, become more creative. I want to unblock what keeps me from loving fully. I want to know myself. I want to see how I feel about my connection to the divine. So intention is really important. And then and, and wait, did we skip P? Because I want to make we sure. We, <laughs> it's okay. No, I says I'm loving this. I want to make sure we get it. So we had educate. And then P is preparation. Okay. Preparation, thank you, is about creating safe set and setting. So creating safe set and setting might be about, well, who are you going to do this with? You're going to do it with 10,000 people you don't know, or maybe you're going to do it with a small group of friends that you really love and trust who've been there for you, um, that have integrity, that are kind and conscious and, you know, pleasing to you or you are people that you're going to make you paranoid. Um, so preparation could also be about what is the set that you're going to be in? Is it going to be clean? Are the dishes done? Is it beautiful? Or maybe you're going to be in nature. But another thing might be maybe you want to have somebody who's not on anything, you know, be the driver or help keep the space safe or say, you know, you really shouldn't take your clothes off at the national park. Um, you know, so maybe you need somebody who's a, a kind of a grounded person who can just keep the space safe. And then maybe preparation means that you think about laying out an altar where you have things for um, beautiful things to smell or some, you know, simple pieces of fruit to taste or oracles. Like maybe you're going to pick an, a tarot card or do the I Ching or maybe, and then music. Cause I'll tell you, there's a lot of music that does not pass the acid test. And then, um, so that's preparation and then intention. Maybe you want to have a journal with you. So the last part of the acronym is C coalesce. So how do you integrate this experience and bring it into your life so that you live a better life more consciously? Um, so I think all these things are possible. And I also want to say that my intention is not to encourage people to use these things, but if they are going to use them, how to use them so that it is something they do with benefit, with safety, with clarity that helps to improve their life and not turns them into, um, you know, a, a freak out. And I know that festivals uh, like Arise and some of the other festivals I teach, they often have a, a safe zone for people to go. Very often, if the music gets scary, you have a lot more people going to the, the Zendo or the, you know, the meditation tent or... Um, safe space. Yeah. Safe space, <laughs> yes. So I think that's really important. I'm really glad that I get to teach about that at Arise. And that's something I've taught for, there for the past um, two years. And I think they're really brave to put that out there because it's needed because we've had this culture of just say no and now just say yes. But like, well, how? We need to just say how. Right. I love it. So, so true. I want to thank you so much for sharing your knowledge with us today on the show from the very, very practical basics that I think, you know, I think everyone who's listened to this episode can just start saving their water, you know, after they do the dishes and putting a basin in the sink is like the easiest thing that we could 
each do. It's just so simple. It's ridiculous to, to, you know, going really deep with us on, you know, some of these specific herbs. And then for people who want to, you know, take it even a step farther into perhaps their, their sacred or meditative practice using some of these psychoactive plants. Um, I'm excited for them to hopefully be able to connect with you even more. Where is the best place? I know you're going to be teaching live at Arise in August. Beyond that, what's the best way for people to find you and get connected with you? Okay. And I will also be giving um, an herb walk at Arise. So I have lots of great classes there. So do check out arisefestival.com. But to find me, I'm at brigittemars.com. So B-R-I-G-I-T-T-E, Mars, like the planet, brigittemars.com. And I have lots of recipes, remedies, articles. Check out my books and keep learning your whole life and bring more plants into your life, whether it be on your body, in your body, in your yard. And I thank you so much for being such a wonderful host. Many blessings to you, Brett. And uh, peace and love. Hope to see you at Arise. Wonderful. Thank you so much. We'll talk to you guys next time. Thank you. Savannah family, I would love to hear what you thought of this week's episode in the Savannah East Facebook group. You can find us on Facebook from savannaheast.com and you can join and have a discussion with me and other folks in the Savannah community about both this week's conversation and as well as what you'd like to hear in upcoming future episodes. I always love getting your requests and feedback, so make sure to join the community there and also ask any additional questions you have. I hope you have a beautiful week and I will speak to you next time. From my heart to yours, namaste. You've been listening to the Savannah Podcast. To find out more about Savannah, go to savannahspirit.com or follow Savannah on Facebook at facebook.com forward slash Savannah Spirit. For daily inspiration, check out our blog at savannaheast.com. Be sure to join us next week for a new episode. And thank you for listening to the Savannah Podcast.